Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Precious and gracious Heavenly Father, I do want to thank you for this day. I pray, Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, you would open up our hearts, our ears, and our minds, and our spirits to thine own. Lord, forgive us where we have strayed, whether it be by thought, word, or deed from thy divine majesty. And teach us now what you would have us learn from this meditation. For, O Lord, your servants are listening. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. For you, O Lord, are my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. And it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Boyles, and I want to welcome you today to our virtual Bible study. And today we're continuing our study of Explore the Bible, looking at the Old Testament prophet of Amos. And today we're going to be giving you a message that's entitled, Turn to God, and it's from Amos chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Well, in a way, I want to take some time before we get started to just let you know that the book of Amos is an interesting and majestic way of using the name of God. In Amos 4.2, we find the term Lord God used. And this term is, is, is very different from what you might consider in, in other texts. A few such as uh, the English versions of the NIV and the NET use the term sovereign Lord. While it is unusual, it literally translates to the words Lord Yahweh. And Yahweh is the Hebrew name of God, which was revealed to Moses at the time of the burning bush. The representing words, I am that I am. And because the ancient Jews were sensitive about taking God's name in vain, they would often translate his name using the word Lord, and that's in capital letters, L-O-R-D. So we often find that in our translations of the Old Testament. But in Amos, the word is Adonai, a word which actually means L, smaller letters, O-R-D, Lord. And it's still used for Yahweh. But to avoid using the term Lord, lowercase, Lord, because they began using the words Lord God. And the word Amos uses for God our most eloquent and exalted use of his name. And it's used more than 20 times. So today we'll discuss the second of the five prophetic messages that we find in Amos in chapters three through six. Now let me take some time here to, to kind of go back to chapter three, uh, the chapter before where we will be today. And in verse three through six, Amos asks several rhetorical questions. For example, in the first two questions, there are, do two men walk together, walk together unless they have made an appointment? The second one is this, it goes, does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Now, the listeners of these questions would all understand that the obvious answer to each one of these questions is no. But here, Amos is trying to make a strong point, a point which in effect, he is saying a prophet cannot but prophesy when he has heard the Lord. In other words, when he's heard the Lord speak, he has to prophesy. And in verse eight, he presents a concluding finale to the oracle in saying, a lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophecy? This is who Amos is. He's committed. He speaks with truth. He speaks boldly. Four different times of the use houses in chapter 3 and verse 15 testify to the extravagant lifestyle of the wealthy in Israel. Now, years earlier, Ahab had a summer residence in Samaria and a winter residence in the warm Jezreel Valley. Apparently, in those later years, many of the wealthy Israelites began to do the same. There were their winter houses and there are their summer houses. 
We see a lot of that today, don't we? People who, who go to Florida during the winter and then go back to their normal homes. These are the houses that are often referred to, the summer houses as the House of Ivory and the great houses, the excavations in Samaria and modern times that have revealed some of the artifacts and how extravagant those residents were. And so as Amos preached, he was saying that God would bring down judgment and destroy them all. And that's where we get into chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, where Amos addresses the cows of Bashan. As I spoke to the group, Bashan was the fertile table area of the land northeast of the Jordan River in Israel, where the finest cattle in all the land were raised. And our God's not a woke God. He uses a term that very much is everyone is able to understand because these cows were famous for their quality of meat, but also we know that cows don't care about anyone else. All they care about is the grass that's in front of them. They don't care if there's any other cows. It's all what's for me. And so when Amos was referring to the wealthy women in Samaria, he calls them the cows of Bashan. They were rich, they were pampered, they were idle, they wanted everything for themselves. They were no disrespect. They were like cows. That, and they, they, they feasted off others, the lower class of people that they had reduced to poverty through their impression. So when you look at the general outline of Amos, you've got the judgment that goes on between the nations in the first two chapters. There are, as I've already mentioned, the five prophetic messages that are in chapters three through six, and five more prophetic visions in seven through nine, verse 10. And then of course, there are the blessings and renewal for Israel in chapters nine, verse 11, all the way through verse 15. Last week, we learned that God sends his judgment upon those who reject his word. He's very concerned about those that refuse and are disobedient and don't listen, and he becomes angry when we show no mercy ourselves. Furthermore, God is going to bring destruction on those who mistreat their leaders. And today, today in our message, we'll also learn that God holds those in contempt who make it a practice of themselves to oppress the poor, those that do not. And we may say, Pastor, I, I, I don't needlessly get in the way of those that want to come to know the Lord or oppress them, but whether we do it intentionally or unintentionally. There's another aspect, and that is when we give sacrifices to God, when we disobey him, we make him angry. And God's going to bring severe judgment on the land and on the people who make it a practice to sin against him. So as we look at the preceding passages in the background text, let's take a minute and recognize that God's judgment against sins of his people, as pointed out in Amos chapter 3, will be as obvious as a lion which roars when he's taking his prey. The first aspect of our lesson today in, in verses 1 through 5, we find that sin always or sinful ways have increased amongst the people of Israel. We'll go back to that first statement. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that we may drink. The wealthy women of Samaria were demanding that their husbands would satisfy their craving. And even though they would satisfy their cravings through what their husbands would do to exploit the poor, they were just as guilty. And the phrasing that we read here in scripture indicates that the women were being fattened for slaughter. Oh, those are harsh words. And in verse two, it says, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness. 
Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks. This is a depressing picture. Whether you know, raised to slaughter, I worked in a slaughterhouse. I know what it's like. And the carcasses and, and what happens. And this is a vivid picture that they will be taken out. At the last of you with fish hooks. Amos was likely pronouncing a very judgment that would indicate how their captivity would take place. Listen, we know that the Assyrians were known for their mercilessness, their cruelty. Uh, they piercing the noses of their captured victims with hooks and, and leading them away by ropes and, and, and by hooks attached to them. We said last week, when the time comes, when the judgment comes, it won't be pretty. It wouldn't be pretty then and it won't be pretty now. Verse 3, it says, you will go out through the breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. This prediction is that, that a, an invading army is going to, to basically punch through to get through everything. And, and no matter where you try to hide, no matter where you're going to go, they'll be able to go through holes and walls. They'll be able to surround the city and the women will be pushed straight out. Now the word Harmon does refer to Mount Hermon on the northern side of the region of Bashan. And, and, and here's, a, here's a kind of an irony of all of that when he talks about the cows of Bashan because they would be cast away in, in an area, cast away like carrion in that region. Verse 4, then it says, Enter Bethel and transgress in Gilgal. Multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Listen. As we look at this passage of scripture, we have to recognize that Amos is being very sarcastic here. You can put on a show if you want, but it's not going to mean anything. Regardless of how others may perceive you, it's not going to mean anything to God. Bethel was the first city where King Jeroboam I set up a calf idol altar, if you recall. And Gilgal is located in the Jordan Valley, northeast of Jericho. And it became what was the center of the cult of worship. And here Amos is mocking them and telling them, go ahead, as I said earlier, go ahead, worship, do your sacrifices. Continue piling up your sins before the Lord because this idea that ties every three days could somehow bringing offerings to the, the idols every few days or so was going to make a difference when it Absolutely is not. And then in verse 5, it says this, Offer a thank offering also from that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings, making them known. For so you love to do, the sons of Israel, declares the Lord God. I think about these women. Why did Amos go to these women? What was it? And and. You know, I, I think about how we used to all like to show up, the, you know, wearing the large hats at church and, and to see who notices us rather than to, to be true worshipers of God. So here, what he's saying is you're offering thanks offerings and free will offerings to God. Of course, you have leavened them, but the offerings were a sham. There was no pretense for worship. This was a pretense of showing yourself off. And look at me. I'm better than. God has no respect for such offerings. And he regards them with contempt. How we worship. God is looking at our heart. And we have to ask our question to ourselves. Are we truly worshiping God? Because small warnings are being ignored. As we read in verses 6 through 11 of chapter 4. Warnings that could very well be available to us today as we look at this and see how it applies. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. 
You know, when we use this expression, cleanliness of teeth, it, it's really reflecting on the fact that there's no food. There's no food to eat, so you don't have any meat caught in between your teeth, that unsightly look that you don't want when you go out to eat. And so that's what it's being said right here. There's nothing they have empty stomachs they they are without and God has signified that his judgment is causing this shortage of food and, and supplies and they're not getting the message they're not turning to God and verse 7 furthermore I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until the harvest and then I would send rain in one city and on another city I would not send rain one part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. God's sovereign. God's in control. Good happens to bad people and good happens to good people. Bad happens to good people and bad happens to bad people. Here in text with what we were looking at, the spring rain was completely essential to obtain the summer harvest. And in this warning to the people, God would send rain in one city but bypass another. Some cities would run completely out of water. So in verse 8 when he says, So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Sometimes when we commit our sins against one another, uh, we, we seek out satisfaction and continue to find other people and dismiss what we, we've lost rather than recognizing why we've lost this friendship or this relationship because of our behavior and turn to God and ask for forgiveness. These people from these cities had run out of water and they would stagger, they would be exhausted. Traveling from one city to another, trying to get satisfaction, trying to get water, but they would not be satisfied. In the NIV it says, did not get enough to drink. We see that today in people that go from one church to another, seemingly as if this church is not feeding me the way it should be rather than going about worshiping God. Verse nine, it says, I smote you with scorching wind and mildew. And the caterpillar was devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. And you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I like this reference back to the gardens because I believe the garden is essential. This is where we, 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 we grow vegetables. This is where we grow things. This is These are the things that are of, of importance and substance. The vineyards to drink, the wine, the olive trees for the oil. And the word scorching winds means that we're, we're talking about the blight that took place. This is how you could see it in some of the most modern translations. That, that premature drying and scorching of the grain caused by the desert winds. Of Arabia. Worms brought by mildew which yellowed the tips of the green grain. The caterpillar could, could be translated as the locust which devoured the leaves of the figs and the olive trees. This decimation, this judgment is going to be complete, taking everything. Verse 10, I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your captured horses and I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet, you've not returned to me, declares the Lord. Wars will bring about plagues and death. I was just listening uh, on the news the other day and with, with everything that's going on in the Ukraine and, and Russia and in, in Europe and, and, and wondering whether or not we're even considering the events that are taking place, what would be the disastrous effect of an all-out war? You see, wars can lead to plagues and death caused by famine, by contagious disease. This often occurred in biblical times in Egypt. War would also promote the death of, of younger men 
of nations. And of course, battling very important in those days, the capturing of their horses. And of course, in all of that, on a battlefield, the stench of death would certainly follow. In verse 11, he says, I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I think about the person that's out there in the ocean and he says, if you just save me, Lord, if you just save me, I'll, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll do all these things. And once they're on dry land and once they've recovered, it's all a fading memory. If we look at this scripture, we know that during wars and, and some of the cities were burned and people barely escaped. Certainly reminiscent of that that took place in Sodom and Gomorrah. Amos repeated this phrase, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. He did it five times. Because we often miss what God is doing for us to get us to turn to him, to be able to say, I can't do it myself. There's no place I can go. There's no place I can run. There's no place I can hide. And these vivid messages God was sending as a judgment against them for their wickedness. Then in verse 12, Therefore thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. God was now saying, Since you have ignored me, yes, since you've not paid attention to my warnings, you haven't listened to anything that I have told you time and time again, prepare to meet me. This is a serious judgment. He was saying, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Boy, I can remember those conversations in my family when I was caught doing something wrong. And all of that was gone over with me. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. All that punishment. And because I'm going to do this to you, you better be prepared to face me. In verse 13, it says, For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts. He who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. This is a picture that presents here the very darkening of the clouds as we prepare for the fierce storm that is about to come. God's going to bring judgment, just as he did then on us today. And it's the same God who created the mountains and the wind. We are without excuse. And God has made that known to us. He has taught us what is right and wrong. Our God is a majestic God who walks on the very highest heights of the earth. He is the sovereign Lord that concludes Amos' second message. May God bless. I pray that you'll continue to, to be with us as we continue our Bible study and explore the Bible with the Old Testament minor prophets. God bless. Have a great day.